Sounds so pretty when they suck, doesn't it? I got the mic on. There we go. There we go. Um, but how many of you have actually been through the refiner's fire? Been through those times in your life where, where God was bringing you to a next stage, a pure stage. But in order to do that, certain things had to be burned away. And I don't know about you, but I like the things I have. Good things, bad things, I, I like my things. And when God says, no, I need that to go, I need to, so that you can grow, I don't like it. I don't. I like life the way it is, and I don't want change. I didn't want my girl to go away to college, but she left. And I knew that was part of the fire fire, both for me and for her, right? But I don't like it. Am I the only one? Have you been there where God is bringing you through it and you're like, I don't like it. I want it. It can feel like darkness, right? It can make you wonder, why me, Lord? Why am I going through this thing when nobody else seems to? Why do I have to endure this? Have you been there? Well, often, if instead of just asking, after you ask, you listen, you'll hear God saying, because you can. And because with me, you'll grow. And this will be more than you thought. In fact, when you get through this, and I need an amen from someone out there who has experienced this. When you get through this refiner's fire, when you get through this period, you consider a dark time, not only will you feel like you've grown from it, but you will not trade it for the world. Amen. A couple of you, okay. Praise God. You've seen that the thing you thought was destructive was actually freeing. There were some young men Judah, who were going through that very thing. You see, they were born princes in God's kingdom. You know, his kingdom on earth at least. The chosen people, they were princes of them. I mean, you can't be much higher in the ranking than that. The problem is, God's chosen people weren't acting like God's chosen people. And they continue to prostitute themselves over and over and over again. That's a biblical analogy, meaning they continue to worship idols and be like the other nations so that they can become uh, more popular with the other nations. Have better trade routes and all this sort of stuff. They turn their backs on God, and they, uh, our God, and turn them to other gods because that's what the other nations were doing. So God said, fine, if you want to be part of worshiping with these nations, I will let you be with these nations. And by the time they were early teens, Nebuchadnezzar had swept down through Egypt, came into their land, and overthrew the kingdom of Judah. In order for Judah not to be destroyed, they agreed to pay tribute to Nebuchadnezzar. They agreed to be one of his, uh, you know, signposts or outposts for his kingdom. So one of the things he demanded from them was, fine, I need your best men, okay, your brightest and best, the ones who are, are well-educated, athletic, good-looking, and I'm going to take them to Babylon to be retrained. And so he did. He bound them all up. He took them on the journey from Judah to Babylon, and when they got there, well, they got more than a haircut. I'll just leave it at that. Bible scholars know exactly what I'm talking about. And then he, um, he took things from them. Not only did he take their home, but he took their names. Changed their names. See, they were Daniel, Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah. But they said, no, we don't want you to answer to 
the names of your homeland, we want you to answer to your new country, your new allegiance. And so it was Belshazzar, Belshazzar, not having a stroke. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now they find themselves in Nebuchadnezzar's land. Far away from home, their names changed. The um, chief of the eunuchs comes to them and says, guys, we have food from the king's table. It's delicious food. It's the best that there is in all the land. We want to give it to you. But when they looked at the food, they saw two things wrong with it. One, it was unclean by the type of food it was. And two, it was unclean by the style in which the food was presented, meaning it had been offered in worship to the other gods, to Baal and to uh, Marduk and to others. And by eating it, they were participating in the worship. And so the four men said, you know, it's only a matter of food. We know that these gods mean nothing, but we have to stand for something. So many of you know the story. They said, you know, we can't eat this food, but if you allow us to eat some vegetables and drink water, test us at the end of seven days and see how we turn out. And they all were so much smarter and so much wiser than everybody else that they allowed them to continue their reign and they continued to build themselves up. The king has a dream. You guys know the story. And he dreams of uh, this statue with head of gold and, and, and uh, breastplate of silver or the breast of silver and the arms of iron or bronze and the legs of iron and then the feet mixed with iron and clay and he doesn't know what's going on and that new comes to him and says, oh, that because a uh, God's giving me the answer to this dream and the head represents you and then the next is uh, the kingdoms that will come after you, Greece and Middle Persia and finally Rome. And, and, and then because if all he hears is, so I'm the head of gold, huh? Cool. So Nebuchadnezzar goes out and, and he builds a huge statue to represent him. Okay, all gold. And he calls every person that, that, that is of worth in the kingdom, the kings of other nations that he's conquered, uh, his uh, magistrates and wise men, and they all come together over the plain. And the statue is there. And he said, we're going to play the music, and the music will play, and the trumpets will blow, and all these things. And then, at the appropriate time, you will all bow down to the statue to show your allegiance to me and my kingdom. Worship it just for a second. And so the music plays, the trumpets blow, everything goes on, and everybody bows down. But three men. They had been singled out by others in the king's administration has someone they want to get rid of. Because as they kept following God, they kept growing in the ranks. They kept doing better and better in what they did. And the others didn't like it. They didn't like these foreigners coming up and growing in rank. And so they were looking for an excuse to destroy them. And they found it. These four men will not bow down. So they bring them to Nebuchadnezzar and say, oh, these guys don't love you. They don't serve our gods. They won't worship you. They're seditious. They're evil. Would you kill them? Nebuchadnezzar loved these dudes. He loved them. They were his boys. But Nebuchadnezzar was also a madman. Okay? He was that villain you see in every action movie that you're like, why do people work for him? You know? Like, like, like you know, there, he's like, tell me what you're saying. And the guy stumbles his speech a little bit, and he turns on and shoots him. And he's like, no, what was I saying? You know, you're like, what, why do people work for this guy? That was Nebuchadnezzar. He was a madman. When people would cross him, he wouldn't just kill them. He would bury them up to their heads in, in, in the ground. And then he would walk, make them watch as their families were mercy, uh, uh, mercilessly executed in front of them. Pieces cut up, piece by piece by piece. And then he would burn their houses down and cover it with manure, and then he would kill them. And so when anybody walked by the place where they used to be, they would only smell stench. This is Nebuchadnezzar. He's insane. He's a vicious, bloodthirsty monster. And these four, these three here, Daniel, we believe is off Cyclops, have decided that, you know, we're not going to follow his decree. Now, this is an estimate to how much they were loved. 
Nebuchadnezzar hears this and he's all, oh, 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 oh. okay, 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 listen, listen. You obviously didn't understand the directions. Kill the guy who gave the directions, because he didn't give good directions. Here are, so what we're going to do again, so you guys are here, so you hear straight from me. We're going to play the music again, okay, everybody's going to stand up. We're going to play the music, we're going to blow the trumpets, okay, we're going to do the thing. And then, when that happens, then we'll all, and he's about to bow down again, and they stop and say, no, king, just stop right there. You can do it as many times as you want. We didn't misunderstand. We're not going to do it, because we will only worship our God. Now, you all say amen. Amen, I believe it. Yes. But they said this. Neb, and he lost his mind. They had furnaces there that were used for smelting the gold. And so they said, stoke these things up seven times hotter than they already are, as hot as you possibly can. Just keep burning, and we're going to throw you. He said, bind these guys and throw them in the fire. And this is where we pick up the story. Turn me in your Bibles, or we on the screen. To Daniel, the third chapter. And starting in the 19th verse. They work now. So while they are looking for it, I will start reading Daniel the third chapter. And starting in the 19th verse. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Notice, by the way, how they're referred to. And his attitude towards them changed. He ordered that the furnaces be heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the burning furnace. So these men, wearing their robes and trousers and turbans and the other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. When I was a kid and I read that story, I was like, God's about to step in and keep them from the fire. You watch. Just like he kept them lion's mouth closed, just like he parted the way, he's going to keep them from going in that fire. And then I read that part. And these men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing fire. Have you been there? Have you been at a place where you're trying to do what God has called you to do? Be the Christian he's called you to do, and yet and still, people are trying to tear you down because of it? And you're like, that's okay, my God lives. He's going to protect me. He's going to keep me from having to go through this thing. And all of a sudden you find yourself bound and thrown into the fire. And now you are in the fire. Do I have anybody in this place who has been in the fire before? Yeah. Terrifying. You know, we can just casually breeze past this and be all like, well, we know what happens. But when you're going through it, you can have faith that you see the end. You can have faith that God is with you. But it's something to be in the fire. Okay? There's that moment, even Christ went through it, we talked about it, where you can't see past. And you've just got to trust. Next. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement. In amazement. And he asked his advisors, oh, wait, guys, 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 whoa, whoa. It's the Nelson version. Like, weren't there three dudes we tied up and threw in the fire? They're like, of course, Your Majesty. Look, I see how many? Four. Four doing what? Walking in the fire. Brothers and sisters, they were bound. They were thrown in. They couldn't walk. But something happened in the fire that set them free. Someone say hallelujah. And now there are four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth, and the fourth looks like what? Says, Son of God. So it says, God's. 
But he, the body, he looks, he looks special. He looks special. Then Nebuchadnezzar approached the opening of the blazing furnace as close as he could get. Because remember, this thing is so hot, it's killing anybody that gets too close. And he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out! So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did what? Came out of the fire. Came out of the fire. If you're in a fire right now, and you're afraid that it might destroy you. It, if the fire you're in is so hot that no normal person can survive it, your marriage, your health, maybe you lost your job and you don't know how you're going to get by in this economy. Oh, brothers and sisters, I've got good news for you. There's another in the fire. Three things to remember when we stand in the fire. To remind ourselves that we don't stand alone. The first is this. Remember that the thing that brought you to the fire is most likely the thing that's going to bring you through the fire. Okay? The second is this. The fire that melts wax also hardens iron. And finally, never forget, there's another in the fire. Father in heaven, we ask that you would speak to all of us today, but especially to those who are enduring a fire, a fire that they feel is about to consume them. Guide them, be with them, fill them, and let them know they are not alone. We pray these things in your heavenly name. Amen. Maynard, my cousin. I told you about my cousin Maynard, right? Maynard uh, was, was, was at a friend's apartment and cooking and forgot about what he was doing and the fire starts in the kitchen and starts consuming the entire apartment. It, front door is blocked. Everything else is blocked. And he's on like the fifth floor. Okay? So he's calling out and he looks outside the window and he sees the Maui Fire Department coming to rescue him. He's like, oh, good. But then he sees something that terrifies him. His cousin. His cousin is, because he's Portuguese, one of the biggest practical jokers ever. And so he comes, and they come out, and they bring, you know, the, the, the towel, the, the sheet that they're going to catch him in. They're all holding a corner of it. I said, Mayor, just jump down, and we'll catch you. He said, no. Nah. I see Joseph down there. I'll trust that guy. I said, Mayor, the fire's going to destroy you. You have to jump. It's your only chance for life. He said, Nah, I'll trust him. He's going to let go. He's going to pull away. I said, Mayor, just jump. He's all I'll jump. But first, put down the sheet. Do we ever try and control our fire experience and in doing so reject the very help that God's tried to send us? Often the thing that brought us to the fire will bring us through it. The thing that brought them to the fire was their standing for God, no matter what their circumstance. The enemy had tried to steal their identity to assimilate them, he had taken them from their homes in bondage and robbed them of their very names. But far from home, without a name, they did not forget the identity they had. They realized that their identity was not as Israelites or Judeans, but their identity was children of God. And no one could take that from them. Do you know what your identity is? Are you so sure of it that you have determined that nothing is going to steal your identity from you no matter what they do? Oh, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> they were faithful though taken from their birthplace because they had a home with God. We are not the place we live in or where we're from. And nowhere is that more important to say than here in Hawaii. Okay? You are not the place you are from. I have never seen any other place in the world that actually tattoos their zip codes on their bodies. It's as if they get lost or something, someone can send them home. Oh, not a coolie, you go in that bus. Oh, why not? You go in that one. We are proud of where we're from, aren't we? 
I often get into a debate with my favorite people about which island is best. You know, Oahu, you know, the Hawaiian Islands, or the Bahamas, okay? Now, 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 the answer to that is, we're both in Hawaii, and ain't nobody in the Bahamas, but it doesn't matter, okay? We, we debate about this stuff. We get so proud of it. The problem with that is sometimes we get so proud of it, we allow the tendencies of that culture to creep in to us, right? And we start to say stuff like, well, I'm from Hawaii, so this is just how I act. <laughs> Take the girl out of the Hawaii, but you can't take why not the girl. Am I right? Amen. <laughs> but we're not where we're from. Our identity must lay in something deeper. Because the only island that I care about is whatever island is in heaven. Yeah. Being on Jesus' island. Okay, because I can make a home there. I'll make that like Gilligan's Island. All right? I get coconuts and stuff and like make myself a whole phone system, a little computer out of a bamboo forest. I don't know. But as long as I'm on Jesus, I'm, I'm going to be okay. They didn't let their taking from their homeland affect their identity. They were faithful in bondage. Okay, there's a, it's, it's a weird thing when you get bound. You know, it feels different. I once had someone put cups on me just to see what it felt like, you know? And immediately I was like, take these things off me. Something changes in you. It's, it's, it's constricting. And these men were in bondage, but they didn't let it bother them. Because they realized something. That before Nebuchadnezzar bound them, they had bound themselves to God. And so in binding themselves to God, he had set them free. Get one more of that. I said, you see, see, we were born in bondage to sin. Okay? But, but, but God came along and said, I'm going to set you free. And the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. So they had come to God and said, We're going to accept you and release these bonds that sin has placed on us. And so now, because we bind ourselves to you, we realize in every other thing, we are free no matter what anyone does to us. And so while the others were whining and complaining and crying and lamenting, lamenting, it's not a word, lamenting, lamenting their situation, they bound themselves to God. Remember the binding they had, and then their binding to God bound them to each other. And so the four of them began their own church. One of the reasons we come here today, we're in this place, is to remind ourselves we are bound to God and we are not alone. Look to your left. Look to your right. And realize that you are bound to a bountiful home of believers who are bound to God. Amen? Amen. No matter how confusing the dark land is that you live in, when you bind yourself to God in everything, you bound yourself to a community of freedom. They were faithful even though the enemy called them by a different name. They lived their identities even when everything else said that they were something else. Have you been there? When everything else, maybe your spouse is calling you everything by the name of God. Maybe your kids don't respect you. Maybe society looks at you as a bum. But you know something deeper than that. I don't care what you call me. I am a child of God. Amen. It can be hard. It can be hard. Like, like, they're so intrinsically bound to their Babylonian names that even the Bible writers call them that. Who, who here knows who the, the three names are that Babylon called them? Let me see. What are the three name Babylonian names they have? We just said it. Shadrach? Meshach? And Abednego. Right? Right? If, if you want the modern translation, you can go with Rakshak and Bindi. We'll allow that. It's uh, Veggie Tales. 
Who here knows their godly names? Say a Bible teacher over there. What is it? Yeah, very good. Anybody else do that? Are you like all glaring at it because you're like, show off, teach his pet? <laughs> Ananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. But even the Bible writers refer to them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You will get into a place where even people in church will be like, oh yeah, this is Bob. He used to be in prison, but he's out now. And Sarah, not Sarah, Sarah, we have a Sarah here. Um, Kuifu. No, no, Kuifu's good. Kuifu, yeah, she, she used to have an affair. You know, she, she used to be the whore, but she's good now. Even people in the church may not see your identity. But here's the thing. That doesn't change your identity. The enemy is going to be whispering it in. Say, That's not who you are. That's not who you are. But who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Amen. Don't forget it. The enemy can call you everything he wants, but you can be faithful knowing that you have been called by God his child. And it's in staying faithful in these things that allows us the faith to get through the bigger things. You hear what I'm saying? Luke 16.10. Luke 16.10 says this. Whoever can be trusted in very little can also be trusted in very much. And the same is like with whoever is dishonest with very little. They will in turn be dishonest with very much. The three would not consume the enemy's food even though everyone else did. Think about that. They have hundreds of princes and royals who come into the kingdom. And, and they're desperate to eat because they ain't been fed on this long journey, but like moldy bread and maybe a few drops of water. You know, that's to condition them so that whatever food they got, they would be appreciative. And now they get into a palace where they're getting the delicacies of the land. The risk for them to stand up to that would be like, well, then you can starve them. And like I said, Nebuchadnezzar was a bit of a madman. He could just execute them right there for turning the nose up at his delicacies. But they stood for something as simple as food. It would be easy for them to eat around the plate, right? I mean, I grew up a vegetarian in Hawaii. You know how many luau's I went where I was just like, well, there's a rice. I can eat that. <laughs> salad. Oh, no, there's tuna in the salad. The crouton. I can eat the crouton. You can pick around stuff, okay? And it made it appear like they were complying while still, you know, in their hearts being good to God. But they said, no. We will not identify ourselves and we will not let ourselves be identified with anything the enemy has, even in the small things. They gave them the strength to stand when they faced the fire. The enemy offers you his food for free. Have you seen his buffet? Anxiety, fear, bitterness, pride, offers it to you every day. Some of us, the first thing we do when we get up in the morning is we grab that screen, right? And we start consuming the delicacies of the enemy, feeding us with things that we later on pray to be set free from. Stand, brothers and sisters. Stand in the power that God has given you in our identity to turn away that food. Say, I will not define myself by likes on a screen or by what someone else says is the example of prosperity. I will instead define myself by who God called me to be. And you were called to be what? Child of God. Praise God. Second point. Second point. The same fire that melts the wax hardens the iron. 
Nebuchadnezzar just had the fire stoked seven times hotter. You know, biblically speaking, that's to the perfect heat it can possibly be. To completely consume them. The fire was so hot that the ones who threw them in the fire died. So hot that no one outside the fire could even get near to them. And to that, you know what I say? Praise God. You may have to go something so destructive that it would kill most people. And I know some of you in here have been through that. But God is with you. And in going through this, he's burning off the things that have kept you chained to all those other things while keeping you intact. Someone say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sometimes God allows you to go through the fire to burn away our bonds and to destroy everything that's holding you down. And sometimes he allows you to go through the fire to remove toxic people from your life. Someone say, praise God. God. See, soldiers couldn't get close because they didn't have the relationship with God. And you ever notice that for some of you, when you go through the hardest times in your life, a lot of people just disappear. Like, 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 all of a sudden, you're like in trouble and the phone don't ring. They won't answer. And we're like, why, Lord, why did you leave me all alone? My parents won't even call me. My siblings don't want nothing to do with me. What's going on? And God says, you're welcome. Because I had to put you through something so hot, so intense that people who aren't with me will fade away. And it will allow you the opportunity to stand with me and to see my face. Jumping to the third point, it's okay. So often the fire that brings us close to God pushes out the toxic people that are trying to draw us away from God, you know? I have daughters, so I understand a little bit about praising God for fires that they don't like, you know? And one time my daughter came to me, she was really going through a rough time. And she's all dead, you understand? I broke up with my boyfriend. All my friends are like, you know, not my friends anymore. And I'm like, oh no. I'm trying to like, you know, be supportive and stuff. But like inside I'm like, yes, yes. Because they weren't people who were drawing her closer to God. They were a group that were drawing her the other way. And she was strong. But even the strongest can struggle when the pull is so hard. And so she goes through this thing and it burns them all away. And gives her the opportunity to draw closer to her Savior. Are you going through something that has left you feeling all alone? That, 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 that people who used to be around you all the time are no longer there, praise God. Because the same fire that is strengthening you is burning them off and keeping them out of your life. And you may be like, but Lord, I miss them. They were so important to me. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. They may have had a prominent place in your life, But that doesn't mean that you needed or even wanted them there. It's sometimes better to feel alone than to be in the crowd of people who are destroying you. Job 23.10 says this, But he knows the way that I take And he has tried me. He has tried me. He has put me through the fire so that I will come out like gold. God sees something amazing in you. And you may have covered yourself with so much negativity, so much uh, reliance on the world, so much bitterness that you can't see it in yourself anymore. You may say, well, I hope I'm saved. I hope I'm a child of God. But I just don't feel it or see it. You know what the fire does? It helps you see it. It helps you see it. 
Now, if you're going through the fire right now, if you're somebody who's going through it, I don't want to seem, you know, flippant about it. Like, ain't no big deal. Just stick close to God. It's intense. It's intense. And I will say, absolutely, it would kill most people who don't know God. You've heard Sacha's testimony. You've heard Angel's testimony. And I know all of you have a testimony as well, but these ladies have been through things that would literally kill most people. Destroy them. But I'm going to say something. People they grew up around aren't in church today. And they are. Full of the Spirit, praising God. Not in spite of what they went through, but sometimes because of it. Because it forced them to hold on and Amen. grab close to God. And know that though everything else falls away, He is still mine and I am still His. Amen. Even when I don't feel it. Praise God for the fires in your life that purify you. And a lot of times when you're purified, we think, so that we're never sinful again. Purify means that you can see the goal that God sees in you. Amen. So you can realize God is doing a mighty thing in me. No matter what else I lose. This sermon keeps on running away from me. <laughs> Finally. Finally, never forget, there's another in the fire. Neb thought he had destroyed them, but then he looked closer. Do you know what I said? Nebuchadnezzar thought he had destroyed them. Has the enemy got you to a place where he thinks he can destroy it? Where the world says, oh, it's over for them. But then they look closer, and they say, uh-oh, uh-oh, they got something deeper in them. There's some, they're not alone. I thought I was just dealing with a, a, a couple of chumps. But I didn't realize I was dealing with children of the Most High God. Yeah. He destroyed them. But then, he looked closer. And what he saw was he saw them walking with Jesus. And when they came out, when they came out, because they did come out, okay, they're not still in the fire hanging out with Jesus. They came out hanging out with Jesus. But when they came out, do you know what Nebuchadnezzar, this one who tried to destroy him, this madman, this, 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 this bloodthirsty monster, you know what he did? He praised God. He fell on his knees glorified the Most High God. He made a decree that said if anybody, if anybody would speak against Hanel, Mishael, and Azariah, they will be put to death. And if they speak against their God, they'll be destroyed. Now, he's still getting the grace thing down. But he's honoring God. Their stand calls the most powerful man in the world. And even more so, even more so, their fire experience gave them an opportunity to see God in a way that most people didn't. Can you think about that? Can you imagine that? You think it's done, you think it's over, and all of a sudden you look up and there's a hand reaching down to lift you up and you know it, a face you've never seen but you've known all your life. Jesus with you helping you up and talking. They talk face to face with Jesus because of the fire. Those of us who have gone through fire experiences realize something powerful. We realize something powerful that we have an opportunity to see God in a special way. In a way that most others don't. Even those in the church 
You know, you wonder, why do they get to go to church every week and just have a nice time and they're sitting with their spouse and they're all happy? And I just seem miserable all the time. Why? Well, maybe you need to change your attitude. <laughs> and maybe, maybe God is giving you an opportunity to see him in the way that others aren't able to. To experience him in a new and powerful way. Just like Peter walking on the water in the midst of the storm, Jacob wrestling God in the midst of his fear, and Hagar thirsting to death, and then seeing the face of God come down and talk to her and say, you're standing in the middle of a, of a well. Water's all around you. You just couldn't see it. So it is with those of us who allow ourselves to stand for God even though we're put in the fire. We see God in a new and special way. It's powerful. And we come out changed. Changed. Moses, when he saw God in the fire, went on to lead the children of Israel to the gates of the promised land. Peter, when he stopped walking on water, and went back to the boat with God, he worshipped God in a powerful way and became one of the heads of the church. And Hagar. Hagar, when she was thirsting and that she thought her life was over, and God said, I am with you. You are my child. She grew up to be the, father, the mother of many nations. Her descendants still live on the earth today. Jesus, but they're there. Because through the fire, she saw a fourth one walking with her. Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. It says this. But now, thus saith the Lord, he created you, O, oh, put your name in there, O oh, Tim, O oh, Sarah Jordan, O oh, Princeton, O oh, Ariana. He who created you, he has formed you. Fear not, for he has called you by name. Someone say amen. amen. He has redeemed you. You are his. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they shall not overcome you. When you walk through the what? Fire. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. The flames will not consume you. If you've been through the fire with Jesus and you've experienced that saying to be true in your life, say amen. amen. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. And say there's another. Amen. Say there's another, there's another. in the fire. One more time. There's another in the fire. 